pace yourself somewhat but in a race this short man it's going to be tough to pace yourself because somebody's going to break through so it's as tough as it gets here i mean uh, the over 200 miles we're going yeah i consider this as tough as a baja 1000 maybe not logistically as tough but the terrain is every bit as tough if not tougher in one of the year's shortest races, Larry Jacinto Racing opted to forego a co-driver completely and put two of their full-time drivers into the cockpit. The co-drivers, we have very good co-drivers, don't want to take anything away from them, but I uh, you know the car inside and out. I know what it can handle, I know how hard I can push it when I am driving. So when we're coming up to a section that I think maybe we can go faster, I can kind of give Steve some pointers and saying, hey, you can push it here. You don't have to let off. You, you know, the car will take it. The car will take it. And uh, it just it just really helps. Really, it really helps out. Disaster nearly struck as Casey Folks, president of the Best of the Desert Series, was nearly run over while launching the defending champions of the Terribles 250, the Mastercraft team of Will and Emily Stats. Most of the teams were bent on running a blistering race, but Will said last year's win had taught him patience. In that you know that being patient early is going to pay you off. I think that that's what we took away from that because we could have been more aggressive and we weren't. Uh, and we just hung around waiting for our time and then picked up the pace. And I think just that same formula to get up to the front is probably what we'll have to do today. The midday heat was rising as 194 total race vehicles were launched into the desert sand, all of them striving for the same crown. Peeling out of their first pit stop at the Best in the Desert Terribles 250 in Prim, Nevada, the first Bully Dog Speed Technologies car, number 1555, was painfully aware of gearbox problems that had plagued their vehicle for several races. Without a complete transmission change, they could only cross their fingers and hope that the car would make it to the end of the race. Not far away from them came their teammates in the 1528 car, driven by Chuck Dempsey. What's Rick saying to you on these head so headphones right now? He's telling me he's happy, the truck's good, the fans are on, and we're ready to race. Western Motorsports raced with a sense of desperation. Their championship hopes hung in the balance after a DNF at the season opener in Parker. Only a top three run could salvage their entire year. Rick back is starting first in our truck. Uh, he's going to do the first two laps. Rick drives, uh, uh, gets to drive a, a good portion of this race. Last year I raced all three laps. This year I'll just finish. He's going to do a great job for us up front. We are going to do our best to win this thing. We need to. We had a, a DNF at Parker, so we're looking forward to uh, uh, a better run here. Tell me how many miles you have on the truck, how many races you have on the truck, and do you two know each other very well yet? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we uh, got about 500 miles now of test time on it. Uh, but my co-driver is John Vance, and he actually works at Jimco. He got a vast experience in these. And my first time out with that, he actually told me, he said, ah, a little uncomfortable with that. But he was out with me this last 150 miles. He says, uh, now we're the real deal. He says he's very comfortable with where I'm at. So yes, I'm getting a good sense of what the truck's capable and, and what I'm capable Within it. And we qualified 10th yesterday, so it'd give us a good confidence booster for the race tomorrow. The desert would take an early vengeance on Steve when a short and unintentional detour of the main course would turn into a nasty accident. Victor Almi found a race that fit his niche. An aggressive driver, Victor always ran fast and out front, but he would also occasionally outrun his car and finish on the sidelines. Now, in theory, the 250-mile sprint to Terribles would fit his driving style perfectly and make him a top candidate for a podium finish. Lumacraft's machine had been given a facelift since Parker. Hidden under a new paint job was a new transmission that was yet unproven. The team was racing by the old adage, to finish first, you must first finish. The car promised to be a powerful front runner if it could last 250 miles. The 
7200 class truck of Torchmate CNC cutting systems was hoping for a finish as well. Bowing out of the Parker race after waterlogging the engine, the truck was once again piloted by Bill Coons, a driver with a contagious love for desert racing. Their disaster in the freezing rain at Parker had left co-driver Brad Lovell's hands so cold he couldn't even press the horn, and the team hoped for a reckoning at Terribles. up the course, Larry Jacinto Racing's two-driver strategy was working, pushing their car further up the field. I spoke with Steve Raskin about fuel strategy for the day and how many stops they plan to make. We're actually going to stop for fuel once on our second lap, I believe, at pit two. Uh, just fill it up with fuel and go from there, and hopefully there's no other stops in between. Neared the halfway point in the race, the Jacinto Racing Crew prepared for their fuel stop, and more than 100 drivers still behind them prepared for a brutal dash to the finish. As the best in the desert Terribles 250 drew to a close, the sun beat down on what was left of a 194 car field. The Bully Dog Speed Technologies team was next to fall by the wayside when the gearbox that had caused them such concern finally failed. You're out of the car. Did you run one lap or two? Um, I didn't get in. Uh, I was supposed to. I was supposed to get in uh, in 5055. We had a had a gearbox issue and and the car's down. So we've been we've been using this gearbox for a little while and and doing some testing and you know we keep we keep falling short on it. And so we're kind of uh, thinking about making some changes. The Mastercraft truck also began to feel the heat, literally. The temperature of the truck's engine oil was rising fast. Uh, so far, both trucks are running fine. Uh, Bill had a, Bill and Emily had a slight issue. They were concerned about the oil temperature, uh, mostly for the fact that when they're coming up, uh, climbing up to the hills and stuff, the oil temperature is getting up in the 260 degree range. They're concerned about the viscosity of the fuel, or excuse me, the viscosity of the oil and the temperatures and things, but after a little bit of discussion with them back and, uh, back and forth, we're feeling pretty comfortable that uh, they can just press on where things are going and just uh, stay in close communication with them. Tell me about your radios. Uh, you can talk to Rick part of the time, but not all the time. How much opportunity do you have for interaction with him? You know, the mountains back there are uh, tough. Um, you know, as soon as they leave about mile eight or nine, they're gone. We, we have a really good, high quality antenna on here, uh, but it doesn't work uh, over those mountains. We catch them up on the way back in about mile 60. We do have radio communications and telephone, thank God, with our, uh, our Vincent Pit 1 and Pit 2. 17 miles. Yeah. So 20 minutes of communication. That's about it. Okay. In the waning miles of the race, drivers began to push ever harder to improve their track position. It was crunch time, and Victor Almeida had gotten stuck behind a slower car. He was finally able to break free and pass four cars in a row, and a podium finish was still possible. After a serious accident involving two of the front runners, Rick D. Johnson picked his way through the field to take home the overall win. But nearly a hundred other cars remained out on the field, like the 7200 Torchmate truck. Bill Coons' vehicle had seen massive gains in a recent testing session, and running hard might still get him a good spot. We shook things down really well. We went and did some testing in Barstow and tuned the shocks, picked up another 20 miles an hour in the whoops.
Another top finisher was the last remaining entry from the Bully Dog Speed Technologies team. Driven by Chuck Dempsey, the Bully Dog crew had still managed to take third place overall and first in class. Uh, we just, you know, tried to get our, we didn't get the pre-run, so we just tried to learn the curse on the first uh, lap. And we stayed stayed in the hunt with everybody. And uh, we started getting around people as we got it going. We had five guys to get around, and uh, it was, uh, we got around Andy and Welch really because they had some kind of tie-up with another truck, and we sort of went around them, and they were dealing with that. And that's how we stayed out in front all day. And it was a pretty good all day. Uh, our Bully Dog Speed Technology car did great. And about the last seven miles of the course, we had a flat because we were in so much does we had to jump out and fix it so um, that, that was the only bad thing we had today still charging through the field back in the 1000 class Victor Almeida came in for a quick pit stop Despite a poorly revving engine, Victor wasn't far from the finish line, and it looked as if he could still limp home. Miles ahead, the next team across the finish line was Larry Jacinto Racing. The team's strategy of putting two full-time drivers in the car had worked. The bright yellow unlimited class car had pulled off a runner-up finishing class and fourth overall. Tell me the story of your day. Uh, it started out pretty good, so I took, took it easy on the first lap because it wasn't much GPS or nothing, you know, made it through, got through, it was going good, kind of opened up a little bit more and just was fortunate enough to pass a couple people on the side, just to try to keep it together all the way through. Co-driver kept walking me through it, so made it a great day. And you guys don't always, you, you usually end up driving separate. Today we've got two drivers in the cockpit. How did that work out? It worked out good. Jake uh, Johnson, the other driver as well, he uh, kind of pushes me through when he thinks the car can take a little bit more. I kind of slow it down. I think we're getting a little too much. And